And so uh, we are continuing our study about being generous or having generous lives or living generously, right? And so generous living, using our time, talents, and treasure to bless others and glorify God. And so as we, as we just revealed a little bit last week, we talked about really our time and how we could be, use our time to bless others and glorify God. And a couple of things we walked away from, uh, in just case you want to catch up on this, is really to be present, learning to be present. Uh, that's, that's a time, a lot of times, we, you've noticed that if there's sometimes, at one time there was a, uh, a it, my kids were playing video games or something, and it was like two hours they were playing games. I know, probably a bad parent on me, but they were playing a long time, and you ask them to do something for five minutes, and they act like it's the end of the world, right? So that time can slip by very quickly, and so really, the, if you're going to be generous with your time, we need to be learning to live in the present. Uh, account how and where you spend your time. So if you want to know how you are, just as like you would with your finances, is I think doing a, uh, really just beginning to do an audit of time audit. Where do I spend my time? Especially if you, today you're thinking, man, I'm overwhelmed. I just don't have enough time for all the things that I'm doing. Where am I using my time and energy? Uh, put some buffers into your schedule so that you can be flexible. And then I really love this part, and this really kind of highlighted our lesson last week, was to begin to begin to listen and to uh, look for opportunities to, to use your gifts and talents for, for God and for others and to be a blessing to others. And so really this, this uh, series could be just be titled Being, Being Intentional because we do have some resources. We do have some uh, gifts and talents, things that we can do. We do have some, some money that we can use to help others and be a blessing. And so how we use those things and, and how we uh, really just practice this out in our life. So uh, one thing that as I, as I walk through this, we, we, we really began to highlight, and one motive for me to preach this sermon is I want to be known as a generous individual. Like, I just want that. I don't, I don't want the other, right? That's, we have the Christmas Carol, all those other Scrooge, right? Like, all those guys that, that hold money or hold time and treasures, they, like, that's just a, a negative side. What I also don't want, this is the other side, I don't want to project that I am generous and truly not being generous as well, right? That's the other side. Uh, what do they call it today? Virtue signaling, right? Where you, you project, you show all the, look, I'm, I'm, I'm p- playing with puppies. I'm helping this. I'm helping this. But really, you're not, right? <laughs> and so and it can easily get into that. So those are two things. I don't want to be this side, but I also don't want to pretend or project. I legitimately, and I would say this would be all of us here this morning, truly want to be generous with our time, talent, and our treasures. And sometimes we feel like that we're overwhelmed, there's too much to do, there's all this stuff, and so I think some intentionality. Uh, and this morning, really, the, the phrase I want us to get, and I think when you think about your time or your talent, uh, this was a hard step for me, uh, and I'll read this. Uh, the, hardest thing, the hardest things to believe is God wants to use me. One of the hardest things to believe is you think that God wants to use me. Now, we can talk about doing stuff, right? There's always something to do. And, and you can sweep a floor, you can move chairs, you can pick up donuts, you can do all these things. You can help a neighbor walk across the street. Well, all those things you do. But I'm talking more not just those things, but I'm talking that God truly, now listen to me, God truly wants to use you. The person that's broken, the ordinary, the regular Joe, the no special person, that person. And that was a hard thing to realize, especially after I, I got saved and then called into ministry uh, about a year after. And the pastor that I served under was like the man's man. Like one year, let me just share this. And I've told this before, but he, one year he got a deer and elk and a bear with his muzzle loader, his, his ax and his, <laughs> you know, his hands, basically. It was, no, he had a gun and, and that. But he, he was like, he was a t- he was so opposite of me. He was a Marine, uh, or he was a, uh, uh, yeah, he was an engineer. I was so uneducated, it wasn't even funny. He was, he was married with kids, and he just was just a very successful individual outside of his, his, his uh, ministry. And he did everything well, and he was, he was a studier. All the things, and then you had a guy that loved second grade so much that he took it twice just to help his cousin out, uh, that barely could read out of high school, that shouldn't have been in ministry ever, 
that, I mean, I, when I was told people, hey, I think God's calling ministry, like, yeah, you? Really? Why you? And I'm like, I don't know why me, but I truly believe God called me. And so I was walking into that. So you have this, and then you see other people that just God uses in so many great ways. And I don't know about you, but I tend to look at the, man, they have so much talent, so much gifting, and they, they can do so much. And then you're looking at you, and you're like, whew, I don't even know what I got, you know? So the first thing I knew to do when I first got saved I was a janitor, uh, I like to say cu- custodial engineer, uh, when I, was, when I was, uh, first got saved. And I'm like, you know what I can do? I can sweep a floor. And guess what? That was my first job at the church is I just swept the floor. And it felt very satisfying and very encouraging that I swept the floor. I also thought everybody served like that or wanted to serve like that. And so they, they said, you need to clean out the stairwells. I'm like, oh, okay, they're probably already clean. Nope, no one has cleaned those stairs out for years. <laughs> but I was willing to do that. But, but the idea is, is I was willing to just kind of step out there. But it was, a hard, it was a hard transition. So if you've been in church for a while, and maybe you're just like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Or maybe this is your first week back in a long time. Listen, I, I want to I encourage you. I want to really encourage you. God wants to use you. Not what you project out you to be but the ordinary, broken, willing person that you are. He wants to use you. And when you kind of can, when you can say, you know what? God wants to, you know, how I say it to myself is this way. God wants to use Sean Snyder. Like, Sean. And you know what? I can't be my pastor and I can't be other people, but I can be Sean all the time. Like, I'm really good at it. And it's supernatural. Like, I just, it's not supernatural. It's just natural, right? It's natural. (laughs) I can be me. I can absolutely be me. And I can be me everywhere I go. I can be me at the house. I can be me at the grocery store. And I can, I can, I can nail it. And the fact that God will use an ordinary nobody just to, to bless people and be glorify him is really astonishing. You don't believe in miracles. That's a miracle, friend. The know that the, the, the anxiety that I have or the frustrations I have and the, the, the concerns I have deep down inside of me. And God says, no, I want to continue to use you and use you. Now, what does it mean for me? I believe it means to be available. And that's what we're going to look at today is in our, uh, we're going to look at a guy named Peter. Many of you know uh, Peter in the Bible. He's pretty famous. He's one of the disciples of Jesus. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, really where Jesus found him. Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to skip ahead, way ahead, and we're going to see where God, or, uh, God uses uh, Peter and John to really confound the wise by being truly available. Okay, So we're going to learn through this, so walk through this together. In Matthew 4, 18 through 20, it says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Jesus saw them, si- Simon, Simeon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And they were fishermen, just regular guys, just fishermen, And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So it just starts out. Now, that's pretty dramatic. There was a little bit of backstory there. Jesus met them a few other times. But the idea is, we see this. He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Of men. Notice he was using, Jesus is using his, their abilities, their, their knowledge, and he's connecting that to a greater vision for them and their lives, okay? Uh, then we fast forward clear to the book of Acts. Now, the way you would say this if you were just uh, spilling the tea together, I'd be like, Peter goes in the, follows Jesus and yada, 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 one thing led to another, and bam, now he's in ministry, right? Like a lot happened in from Matthew uh, till to this moment, okay? So this moment Jesus has shown Peter all kinds. He saw Jesus walk in the water. Peter himself has walked in the water. He saw Jesus in his uh, glory, his transfigured on a mountain that Peter didn't know what to do with. Jesus saw the Son of God. He actually betrayed Jesus, and then Jesus forgives him, so he's been restored back into ministry and right relationship. He's seen so many things. He saw uh, that Jesus had to pay taxes, and he'd go catch a fish, and he took took the money out to pay the taxes. Like All these mind-blowing things that Jesus, and it started, by him simply laying down his nets and following him. Well, we get to chapter 3, book of Acts. Peter stood up in chapter 2 with boldness preaching where 5,000 people come to know Jesus, come to know him. In verse 3, it says, or uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer of the ninth hour. So in the morning, they're going to the temple, a normal, normal regular day with two really regular Joes, just two regular guys and a man lame from birth, 
uh, was being carried. And you can see how my mind works when I think of lame. When the guy was just not cool. <laughs> you know, he's just sitting there not cool. No, that's not true. He actually could not walk, okay? Uh, it says he had to be carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate, and asks uh, alms of those entering the temple. A normal day, the guy has been there, and he's like, hey, you know, just probably just a regular, just normal thing doing that. Seeing Peter John got uh, about to go into the temple, he asked and received alms. In verse 4, it says, and Peter directed his gaze at him. So, first of all, usually in those moments, that's kind of a reckonor for me, right? Like, if someone's asked, it's like, ooh, you know, I kind of like, I don't notice it. I don't know about you. They're just kind of sharing. But Peter doesn't ignore it. Again, we talked about last week about looking and listening. He looked for an opportunity to be generous, and he listens, and he saw the guy, and he looks right at him. I die. I can't, eyeball to eyeball, right? There's a thing where you can just kind of ignore somebody. It's like, oh, I didn't see that guy. He's like tripped over him in front of the gate, right? But he recognizes him He's, and said, look at us. So he has the guy, he, they're, they're in connection, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said to them, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now that's a miracle, and this doesn't always happen, but this was a miracle, a moment. But what I love, what I see here, is he says, I don't have, it's I'm not giving you money. And again, it, it, we always think, when we think of giving, we always think money. But you know what I really think is amazing? What Peter gave was himself. Because this would kick off a whole trigger of things where we'll see in just a moment where now they're being questioned of why they healed a guy on the Sabbath for all days, right? As he healed the guy, why did, what, what took place here? And so he says, what, I, what we have, we'll give you. And so I think that's really when it comes to uh, being, uh, living generously and God using my life. And really the hardest thing for us to believe is that God wants to use me. And Peter was a fisherman by trade. He was a wild guy. And we see over and over in the Gospels. And I encourage you to read about Peter. But we saw him put his foot in his mouth over and over and over. And here this guy now stands. He sees a guy. He makes eye contact. And he says to him, listen, I don't have money. Or it's not silver and gold. That's not what I'm giving you. But what I have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in the name of Jesus Christ, he was doing it for God. His source was not the guy. His source was his Savior. If you're going to be generous, I really think you need to connect where your source is. If you're trying to be generous to show yourself or project yourself, it's always going to come empty. But if it's because of what Jesus has done for you, Jesus knew, or Peter knew what it meant when he followed Jesus. And now he is a fisher of men. He says, rise up and walk and look at the outcome. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. Well, so if we're to live generous lives, we see really a beautiful example of this, of this generosity. Now we're going to move ahead into Acts 4. Verse 13, 14. So just to give you a little bit of backstory, so I'm not, reading, I'm not going to read it all, but we see that. So they do that. Well, people recognize this guy that was sitting by the temple. This wasn't a huge town. And so things started to spread quickly. And they said, man, this is, this is an event. What took place? And so it got to a place where it hones in on John and Peter and the religious leaders of that day saying, okay, what happened here? Like, why is this guy that could not walk, why is he walking now? Why is this guy restored in health? What is going on? And again, I think this is a spirit or a physical miracle to really give a, a, a spiritual truth. That God does miracles, even in our moat, in our midst today. And I'm really looking at miracles before me. Maybe some of you are like, man, I can't believe I'm in church today. Amen. That's a miracle, right? Like, you're like, I never thought I'd be here today. Some of you are like, wow, I can't believe that I not only came to church today, but I was kind of excited about going to church today. You know, that's the, that never happened for me in my life. And so there were all of this. And then we could say there's some even here that are saying, man, I can't believe not only that I, I'm excited and I'm happy, but I'm actually looking forward to serving in some capacity with the gifts and, and th talents that God gave me. Because what? The, some of the hardest things to believe is that God wants to use me. And Peter is a perfect example of a good person being used. And so verse chapter 4, verse 13, 14, and we'll get to uh, a couple of things I want us to walk away from here this morning. Now, when they perceive the boldness, so now they're, they're really interrogating Peter and John. They perceive the boldness of Peter and John and perceive that they were uneducated, common men. 
They were fishermen by trade. One of the greatest things, I was a plumber, I'm a plumber by trade, and I was doing some work, uh, I was, and this one guy said, Sean, you may be a pastor, but you're still a plumber at heart. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm like, good. Because, <laughs> uh, and what I would say when I was plumbing, I'm a plumber with a capital P, right? Like, I don't know why, but I just feel like that's important. But the, it was uneducated and common. They were just normal people. And I think we have to begin to read the Bible in that way. See, we don't, we don't, we are not awesome people. You say, how do you say that, Pastor? Because the gospel reveals who we are. The gospel reveals that the fact that you are a sinner, really destined for eternal separation from God, which we would describe as hell. You, there is not any good in you. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. And so what the, tr- the solution for you is that Jesus would come on the cross and die for your sins and pay for your sins, that you might receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. You receive that by repentance towards God, uh, repentance towards sin, and, and faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the gospel reveals us. We're all on equal ground. There's no hierarchy here. We're all common, ordinary uneducated. We, we're not special. We're not the exception. God's not, you know what? That one's pretty good, though. No, Jesus died for you, too. And so it humbles us. But then also the gospel reminds us again that your value is beyond your value, that you may feel like you're worthless. You may feel like you're useless. You may feel like you don't have anything to offer. And God says, no, your value, you're, you're my child. You, I love you. I loved you so much that I was willing to die on the cross for you and take upon your sins as mine. And, and, and serve you so that you might know me and know the power of the resurrection. I'm telling you, there's this balance here. And that's what the gospel does. It reveals who we really are. And so we all are equal. Uh, and I love this. He says, they were uneducated common. And they were astonished. One of the most amazing things about Living Hope Church is we're just a bunch of uh, has-been, wannabe, whatever we are, used-to-be's. That God graciously, uh, scandalously, by grace, saved us to give us a part of what he's doing in the kingdom work. And so that's amazing. I love that. And, and God used Peter like he's used many of you. And so God is doing a work. And I love that. So they were recognized that they had been with Jesus. That was what had set them apart. From the beginning when he said, follow me, he began to follow Jesus. And so you say you want to be used of God? If you want to use your gifts and talents to bless others and glorify God, begin simply today by saying yes to Jesus, by following Jesus. And that starts early on in your, that's just maybe, again, some of you, that was today by coming to church today. It was a beginning step. You're like, I am going to say yes and go. And I understand what it's like bringing kids to church and, and coming back to church and, and just getting connected again and, and be, meeting people. I'm personally, my, my own personal uh, position, I'm an introvert. You know, COVID days, you know, when you didn't have to shake hands and all that stuff was like heaven. You know, I could be there, wave at you. It's like, yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> this is nice. You know, now we're back to normal. Yay. <laughs> you know, but that has to go. But I'm willing to set that aside because, I, again, I know it's difficult, but I'm following Jesus with my life. So I can look back to where I started and to where I am. And I can look back in the scriptures and see where Peter started and where he ends up. And he's used and says, they had, and this is what I love. I love when you shut people up. Don't you love that? I don't know, maybe just me. I love when someone has a bunch of stuff to say, and then uh, especially when I'm like fighting with my wife or something, and I'm right, and I don't have to, and I don't have to argue that I'm right. I just eventually, she just like, oh, never mind. And you just know, you just like, got her, <laughs> you know? Not just my wife, that's pretty much anybody. I'm pretty equal on that. Uh, but he, they, look, they, they see the guys that's changed, They see Peter and John, and there's nothing special about them. They look at their education. They're like, they see who they are, and they're like, they're just a bunch of fishermen. I know. What happened? I don't know. Right? There's nothing special about them. I know. Why are they successful? I don't know. (laughs) Well, he's with Jesus. He's been with Jesus for three years. What? (laughs) That changed everything. It says, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. They had nothing to say. Man, just shut up. Now, you get a bunch of le- religious leaders and have nothing. Get a preacher to shut up. Like, golly, like, that's a miracle, right? And so they had nothing to say. And it says, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred one to another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a, that a noble sign had been performed through them is evident in all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. 
And so when God, when you begin to realize that God wants to use you, I'm telling you, we could see God change the world. Just imagine right now if us, just in this room, really, truly, not just believe it, begin to operate on that. Begin to operate that God wants to use me. But the hardest thing for us to believe is that God wants to use me. I can see why I can use you, and I can list all the great qualities of your life and how smart and how educated, but the fact that he wants to use me, it's like, God, are you sure? Are you sure? So the good thing is there's three things I want us to think through, and we can, uh, I can, I'll give you a biblical example, a personal example, and then I want you to think through our, our pathway together. First, he uses, he, God uses ordinary people. Peter was just a fisherman with his brother that began to follow Jesus. They started, everyone in this room is just ordinary people that started a journey. If you think about it, this journey, and, and maybe some of you are like, man, I can't believe that God's been using my life in ways that I've never thought. I just, today, I just talking to somebody, uh, there's people here being used, that their reason why you're here today is someone reached out to you and reached and contacted you. That person wasn't, you know, they, they, they reached out by their own will, their own desire, and so they're being used by God to bless others. And so the ordinary people. And we just talked about there is no extraordinary people. We serve an extraordinary God. We're just normal. And if you ever think, the worst thing you can ever do is to wake up and think, man, I'm better than everybody. Man, that's just like dumb. <laughs> I don't know. That's not theologically. That's just true. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's just dumb. But God uses ordinary people. So that's, for me, it's like, phew, I can use. So can I be used from God? Ordinary. God uses broken people. This one is the, probably the hardest, and this is why it's hard to swallow the fact that God wants to use me. It's because I would look at my pastor, and I look at other people, and I think that their lives are together, and they, their, their families, they got the right family lineage. They, they have the right situation. They have the right situa- you know, the circumstances around their life. They have the right education. And, man, I've, I've, I've almost spent, you know, and especially in those early years, like I had spent the first half of my life really trying to destroy it by myself, by my selfish decisions, by my own desires, right? Like, just follow my own way. And as I begin to follow God, it's like, well, how, I've I've used all of his resources, things for myself, and not not really for others or for God. I've just been so selfish and so self-seeking. And so when, when you really begin to see how broken you really are, and you really begin to understand that really there is only by grace you're saved through faith. There is no reason. I would never want to go by merit to try to compare myself to anything. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. I'm a flaw. I'm, I'm a mistake. Right? That's, that's exactly how I feel. I'm broken. And broken things, you can... So have you ever got a, something shiny new and then someone breaks it? It's like gets a chip. So we've had incidences in our home where we buy cups. For my wife, I buy little catchy cups. And they all get broke. And it's only her cups. And so we've like... And once it's chipped or broke, it's just like... Ugh. You know, it just loses some of its value, right? You get a new car, and then you, you walk in, you finally see, you see that ding on the door, and you're like, what happened, right? You get your new shoes, and you're careful with it, and then someone steps on and scuffs it, and you're just like, oh, well, just got to start walking in the mud now, <laughs> right? We give up. And so, because you can't fix broken things, but the gospel can. And God, not, not only does God specialize, but he seeks out broken people. And I would actually say this, listen, you'll never be used for God until you come to that broken spot in your life. I got saved by grace and then worked like hell to keep it. I worked like hell. I I worked hard. I did all the things I was supposed to do. I was really, I'm a recovering legalist. I had all my things, check all the boxes, do all the things I had to do. But guess what? It wasn't enough because I forgot my first love. I forgot the reason why God, it was by grace that God saved me. It's nothing that I do. God doesn't need me. But God chooses and wants to use me, ordinary, broken, but willing. See, that's the key. You have to be available. You have to be available. And again, I know that we're busy. I know that we're stretched. I know we have demands, and I know we have things. But if, if, God, if you're going to be used to God, there really it is as a set priority that I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to put Jesus first in my life. I'm going to allow God to direct my life. I'm going to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to use it. And I'm telling you, what Peter did is he got, he followed Jesus. 
And that led to one thing after another, to yada, 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 right? Like he sees the Son of Man transfigured before him. He sees him die a gruesome death, and he sees him come back to life. Enough that when he was afraid, to, he's like, I quit. I'm done. I, don't, I broke. I, I lied. Or I, I denied him three times, and I want nothing to do with it. But God, Jesus comes back, restores the relationship, and says, I want to use you, Peter. And I'm going to build my church on you and on your faith. I'm telling you, God wants to use ordinary, broken, but willing individuals. And so we see this in Moses, right? Moses is a, most of us know who Moses is. Uh, and so we see that Moses, when he's, God, he, he tries his own way, right? He kills, a, he kills one of the Egyptians and, and then tries to, tries to be king. And they're like, who are you? So he goes away for 40 years. When he's on the other side of the, uh, his, really, he's 80 years old, and God begins to use him. And God begins to, uh, and he says, I don't have the right speak. I don't have the right, I don't, I'm not the right person. I'm not the right guy. And we know Moses as one of the most fundamental or one of the most famous biblical characters that, we've, that all of us know. Why? Because God uses ordinary, broken, but willing people. And so if we're going to be used, God, if we're, if we're going to let our lives be used, we need to do that. And so, first of all, I think two questions are we need to recognize, number one, God chooses you. He chose you. He wants you. He doesn't want what you think people want you. He wants the person that nobody knows or wants. He says yes to you. He truly loves and maybe you have never heard that in a long time, but he chose you, and he doesn't make mistakes. And so to me, that's just like puts shivers down my spine, thinking, man, God wants me. Yeah, I was a good kid that was like when we were playing dodgeball or baseball or football or any sports, I was like the last kid to pick, right? <laughs> so when someone chooses you, that's a big day. And he's like, I'll choose you. It's like, me? And he didn't choose me last. He chose me first. He chose me. He designed me. He willingly sought me out saved me by grace, and now wants to use me. And so what I just have to do is believe God and by faith, trust him, and use my talents and gifts. And then number two, uh, how can God use me? What is it? What is it that I have that God will use? And so I, I think personally, I think of one thing that about me, I, I've really I thought about this a lot, and I've heard this the, the other day. I was listening to a podcast, and, and uh, this guy was talking about his storyline. His storyline that wherever he does functionally, whatever he does, wherever company he went to, there was a certain personality, certain, certain quality that he brought to the teams that he was a part of. And so I started thinking through, what is, what is it that I, that God uses me to do? And, you know, and I really thought about it I, personally. This is one thing that I really think that God's done in my life and how I truly do care about people. And so when I was plumbing, I would truly care about doing a good job for the plumber, for the, for the customer, for the people. I care. I care. I want to do it right, and I want to do it the best way I can. I, and, and so that's what, God, that's what God wants to use. He wants to use that aspect of me. And a lot of that comes, the reason why I care, is because some of the gifts he's given me. What is it? Anxiety and depression. <laughs> he's given me those gifts because my anxiety goes crazy. And so I want to, to do well. So I have to really hone in and focus and care for people. And so, so some of the things that I see as flaws, God used to put in my life to make me be used of him and did use my talents and gifts in ways that to show care, respect. That's just one area. That's really one thing. There was one time I, uh, I was in class. And so I'll give you two sides. So this guy told me, he's like, man, Sean, you're always the first one to answer. You're the first one to get the stuff done. You're the first one. It's not because I'm a great student or I'm awesome. You know why? Because my anxiety is killing me, and I just want it done. <laughs> I just want it done. I want it done the right way, and I want to do the best. Plus, if you do it first, you get, there's like a curve there, so they're a little bit generous on you. But, but the heart behind that, that's the motivation. But then the person behind that, I truly want to do what's right. And one thing that I would say in my life, what I think about, even if I was to do, if I was to, to do anything for you, I want to make sure it's a blessing to you. That's, that's the storyline I want to bring. And so when I think about ordinary and broken and willing, that's me. And so what do I want to, what's the me that I want to bring? I want to bring a regular guy 
that loves people and loves God and just really serve people by serving God, by serving God, by serving people. And so that's willingness. And so what the beautiful thing about living in church, and I really think this is a beautiful thing, we do have a pathway. There's out in the back there, you can see it on the, uh, in the hallway. There's a pathway, there's a way, there's a place. And what's interesting, obviously, is we, it's one thing to have a chart or something, but to really see people's lives changed. I've watched people come as guests to Living Hope Church, had no desire to be in church, was surprised they're there, they're brought there by a spouse or a friend, and like, how did I get here? And I've seen them, actually, as we walk with them in life and share the hope in Christ, I see them know Jesus, they either come to know Christ or, be, or really begin to uh, understand what it means to know Jesus and have a relationship with Christ, and then they begin to grow and they begin to be known in a faith community. And they begin to love each other and pray for each other and realize that people love them and care about them and want them to be encouraged and strengthened. And as they walk, there, we see really them to grow and just to begin to be healthy and begin to own their faith. It's not just a chart. It's not just some things. We actually live out what we say. We, we want you to, we want to walk with you in life and share the hope in Christ. We want to help you from where you are, not where you should be, where you could be, not where uh, others tell you you are, but where, where you really are. And we want to lovingly help serve you, encourage you, and, and help grow you to be the man and woman that God wants you to be. And who is that? That is a fully known person and fully loved you don't have to be awesome. And I think if we would just walk away from here this morning, because the hardest thing for me to believe is that God wants to use me. But we have seen, I, we this morning, there's 20 people around the table this morning, and I saw a bunch of ordinary, broken, normal people that God uses in extraordinary ways because they're, they're ordinary. They're broken. Yeah. And then they're also willing. They're willing. They're willing. And, and again, guess what? That can be you too. That can be you too. So when I think of generous, if I walk away this morning, I want to think about it. And again, maybe today, just imagine with me, what would it be like if we just recognize that God wants to use me? Not the me that I think other people want to use. Again, a lot of people give us other feedback of us, and we're like, but the best version of me is who God wants to use. And what he does is he transfer, transforms that person from within to make us that person. He works on that. Now, it's not a painless process. I want to tell you, like, who I was then and who I am now, God has, he's, he's worked through some stuff in my life. He's given me people in my life to challenge me and encourage me and threaten me. No, I'm just kidding. They didn't threaten me. But they really tr pressured me. What? They challenged me to see the, the potential that I could be. And I'm just telling you that God, this process isn't always easy because it is afraid to be known, Right? It's when you really understand that you struggle with things, that you have problems, that you are not what you should be. But we see it over and over in Scripture, and we see it in our church setting family. That the, and the hardest thing for us to believe is that God wants to use me. But I'm, I'm grateful for you, and I'm thankful for the opportunity that all of us have this morning. So as we walk out those doors today, I want you to tell you, that I want you to recognize that you're just ordinary, that you're... Uh, that you are uh, broken, and there's probably some things that you want to work through, but God wants to use you if you're willing and available. And so uh, as we pray together, I want to encourage you, maybe today that begins with just saying yes to Jesus in a personal relationship with him. But you just recognize, maybe yours today is just, hey, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Just follow me. And maybe that's your beginning today. So we just want to encourage you. So let's pray, and we'll uh, sing our our song to close. God, we thank you so very much for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. I thank you that you use ordinary, broken people to do extraordinary things for you. I thank you for this example in scripture, of this man that was broken sitting there, that he confounded the wise by what you did in his life. And God, I thank you that people can look at my life and look at others around us and know that they, or that it is really a miracle to see someone's life transformed. And you can do great things. And there's somebody here this morning that needs to know that you want to use them. And I pray that they would have the faith, the courage, the understanding 
that they would just say yes, Jesus. They'd say yes. And that would begin their venture as they begin to follow you and understand what you're doing in through their life. We thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We just ask you, God, that we give this, uh, we just give this service to you in the sense that we ask you, God, to bless and use us in a, in a wonderful way. In Jesus' name, amen.